Um, so I work with a nonprofit called the Neil Squire Society, and we use technology, uh, knowledge and passion to empower people with disabilities. And one of our main core programs is an employment program for people with disabilities. And it's nationally funded, which is different than a lot of employment programs. It's usually provincial mandate things. Um, but to be part of a national program, you have to have a national reach, reach different areas. So we have offices uh, in different parts of Canada. And uh, shortly after I came on, I started doing some work with the Penticton Indian Band in the Okanagan. And they were interested in opening sort of a, like a satellite Neil Squire Center. And they were literally building that uh, log uh, house there um, with some uh, government uh, youth skilled initiative, they teach you different trade skills, they built this house, and then inside of it they offered social services. So I actually went up and lived on the band uh, for a month and helped them kind of finish the building, try not to perceive as the white guy from Vancouver that knows everything, like went through a lot of like, the ceremonial stuff with them, I helped sand the logs, put together, and kind of help uh, resource the disability center. But the idea being that the things that we were doing in our employment program in Burnaby uh, helped deliver those onto the band land. Uh, specifically at that time around different assistive technology and computer technology. This was like mid-2000s, so you know, your Facebook and YouTubes were almost born, but not quite yet. And for many of the people in the community I was working with, like this is a, you know, we're going to sign you up for your first email account. We're going to learn what this fancy search engine thing is all about. Um, so in doing this work, we have in the Maritimes an office in Fredericton and a smaller office in Moncton. They're much bigger now, but back then it was very small. And that was funded as one office that couple staff here and a couple staff there and they ran the program at both those locations by doing what they called distance learning and the person that started that was head of distance learning circa 1980s um, for the province so distance learning for them was a polycom that people sat around a table and lots of binders lots and lots of binders and again mid 2000s telecom isn't like what it is now there's no Skype app or WhatsApp or chat sort of piece so they were paying uh, I think well, 12 cents per minute per site. So it was just like when it was just two of them, they're just you know it's one phone call, it's local, it's not a big deal. But when you start bringing in Chad's Burnaby classroom and the Ticton classroom and then my Vernon classroom, um, all of a sudden it's like okay, so that's like 12 cents a minute. It's a two-hour class times five sites, and we do that four days a week, and that price got like crazy, really high and big. So that's where I started, like, you know, there's these new things called webinars that are being used at the university. How can we use this sort of software to deliver it at a much cheaper cost? We eventually tackled the binders of paper problem, but before we start every 12-week program, we literally have, like, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and I would pick up a binder and have a rolling chair and just go around the desk and put it all in, build these boxes and ship it out. So we moved to more learning sort of management system over time. So the idea that I was sort of pitching was we have this 12-week program that we say is a national program. This really only happens four or five classes. But all these different regions where we were, BC, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and then throughout the Maritimes, had these different partners that they were trying to support. So like, how can we create some sort of systematic way where we can reach these people consistently? Um, we had a lot of resources. We had a lot of materials, different from Tanya. Um, we had like a staff body with these knowledge, and actually, in some areas, like we have, you know, one of the first people that ever had a system technology certification ever in Canada in the Maritimes. Like, let's unlock his brain and share that with other people in different areas. We had some real great wellness experts in BC. How can we show that to our staff in Ontario who do not have that on their team? So it really kind of allows us to sort of share our knowledge, not only to our participants, but within our staff and actually kind of give them all a platform. And helpful care special when we did a webinar. But at first, they were terrified. I mean, I was like, the young guy just out of university, um, and many of them were, you know, on the later stages of their career at this point, right? They were afraid of the computer. So a lot of the webinars started with the Chad show, where it was like I did every webinar. It was every morning because it's like those Eastern people. If I did it at nine in the morning, it's one in the afternoon for them. So it was like four to five days a week for two to three hours for twelve weeks. Take the week off and then kind of start it over again. Um, over time, people kind of saw me doing like. Oh, it doesn't look that hard. Chad barely knows what he's doing. Anymore. I think I could probably do this. And so it came to more a little bit the moral user had where they would talk, I would be there beside them, you know, kind of hold their hand a little bit, make sure the technical weird stuff was sorted out. But it got to a point where I was having 50 people on a time, and it was less of like this or more like I am talking at you, more so like an engaged learning, like let me show you something, now you're going to do it. 
And so I was using some secondary software which let me log into the different people's machines. So very quickly, every time I run this class, I figured like, okay, this is my student that's gonna have the most problem in Penticton, this person's gonna have the most problem in Vernon. So I would have all these monitors on my desk and I could see how Jack was doing and Bernita was doing. And so I could watch them like as I'm doing it, like, okay, Jack, that's Yahoo Games. I think you need Yahoo Mail. And so let me just help kind of like <laughs> click the right thing for you there and keep them on track. But it kind of built up a bit of trust. What I would do, I couldn't always go back east all the time, but to the Okanagan, very early in the program, like week one, week two, I go up there, so I didn't seem like this weird Wizard of Oz guy behind the curtains. I could, you know, talk to them, they could meet, see me face to face. We'd take apart a computer in front of them to kind of demystify the whole thing. So to build that sort of trust so it wasn't a big deal to like, the similar sort of thing. It's like, you know, a lot of these people, their first sort of email account or search engine, and this guy that sees my screen all the time while on it kind of freaked them out, right? So just kind of build that rapport and relationship with people. So what I was eventually able to sort of convince the powers that be at the time is like, you know, we have this BC region, the Saskatchewan region, et cetera, et cetera. Let's have like a virtual region whose focus is really to serve those people that can't get into our offices at all. Um, and we ran into those issues around rural sort of things and phone calls. We had people that were going to the local community center or library to access services. Um, but it became like a real core piece that like these people really reached people that were hard to reach. Um, which at that time, with that current government, that current funding was a big thing. Sort of like really reach the people that aren't being touched. So we started this employment program that's, we still do some of this uh, online, probably less webinar stuff now in this particular program. But we got pilot funding. Um, oh, this is just that sort of at, at its peak of, you know, that was in one class where I had different, you know, it's a like government of Canada funded program. So I literally had people from coast to coast, even had some of them on the Yukon that were kind of following along and working. And it wasn't like a, a one off. These are people like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you have a session with Chad or eventually other people. And then usually it's kind of like we introduce sort of topic in the morning, do some stuff together, and then it's more sort of self directed. Would you follow up pieces on that and then be emailing me back and forth. The part that you talked about um, that was really important that you know a lot of people don't think about it's like it's all this bill for the webinar and get it and you know you deliver the webinar and you're done, but you're not done. Actually that's just you know that's the middle part of your journey, it's all the follow-up sort of pieces. For me, when I was wearing that hat, the role was like, you know, people be emailing their work from the morning or pieces of new marketing and giving them feedback and stuff. But the, this prep for your webinar and prep and doing the lesson and then like praying that it doesn't technically fail on you in the middle of it. Um, but it's the follow up stuff that I find is sometimes more valuable. People will forgive a, you know, a, a weird web connection, but that, that ongoing engagement for me and communication being accessible was uh, more important. We took it, the program that started at Neo Square, kind of started the organization, was basically having um, young engineers. Um, helping teach people disabilities computer access in the early 80s, so making custom accommodations. And we run this on a couple of our offices where you know, someone with disability can come in, they work with a volunteer staff member, learn their computer goals and what their needs were. But we got, you know, we kind of built up this webinar infrastructure. We had, you know, the car paid for, so to speak. It's like, what other sort of things can we drive with it? So we moved to, we still have, like, you can come into our offices and learn computer skills one on one for free. But not everyone's on a SkyTrain route, Andy Dart sort of piece, or lives in the Metro Vancouver area to reach. So we started um, a virtual version of our computer tutoring program, where basically we set on, let's say, Ashley's desktop, you know, a little link, Ashley's class. She can click it, it's her very own webinar room, where the volunteer or staff member can meet her in. And then, um, oh, Ashley, can I see your desktop? She says yes. And then she works on her computer, on her learning goals, on things that she wants. And for us, this actually grew the program significantly. We had, there was a number of people that wanted to volunteer, but Monday to Friday, nine to five, they got a real life and real job. But on Wednesday nights, when the X Factor's on, they don't really want to watch it, but for a significant other, they're happy to spend an hour and a half to tutor somebody. So we started serving the hundreds of people in these sort of hours where our office was closed in the evenings and on the weekends, it really kind of tapped into a skill sort of volunteer base that we weren't getting before. Before we were kind of getting students that were all told they had to they do some hours of me. Um, it really allowed us to get some like professionals in IT and start going to deeper things. We had to be able to teach some people some web design stuff, and that was our goal. Where what was in the classroom was traditionally very sort of fundamental sort of pieces. 
And the part that was really good for me, you see how technically literate it was at the time when I did the, uh, this presentation, like, I can do a flow chart. Nothing's changed. Um, <laughs> but for us, the big part of when we were starting setting up people that were going to be participants in, especially this one-on-one -on -one sort of model, was we'd have an intake, and that was like traditional phone, like, you know, understanding well, there's the computer stuff, and we talk to you in a very normal way over the phone, your barriers, what you want to learn. It's very self-directed. And then we'd have a session beforehand that was just technical setup, where we'd try to make sure the computer was like not like bogged down with viruses or malware or bulletware, um, made sure that they could get to that, you know, Ashley's classroom link on their desktop, set up some technical backdoors, made sure they had a headset and knew how to unmute it and turn it on and off. So much of your time is spent in technical troubleshooting. Um, and we sometimes do an assistive technology assessment if somebody needed it. I had a budget. Sometimes it's wanes, it depends on areas. Um, but you know, if someone had difficulty in accessing the computer due to their disability, trying to figure that piece out. So that when I had them paired with a volunteer and do tutoring, you know, I had a fundamental, like I knew what operating system they had, version of office, what their goals were and what worked and how to unmute their microphone um, remotely. Usually when we kind of started tutoring, the first session or two, like our former staff members would kind of be there, make sure people get connected, follow up, kind of, you know, like you like a prime the pump, make sure things are going well. Um, and then we kind of, after session two or three, we fade out. Even the session one, we both kind of get connected. It's like, okay, I'm going to go cook dinner now. Uh, you got to do your thing, and then you know, I have the headset off a little bit, make sure they're doing, their, doing all right. Um, and at the end of every session, um, like they, when they finish their sort of four months of tutoring, they have this sort of formal skill assessment survey. But at the end of every session, we were able to force a pop up that would come up. So, like, they close the webinar program, pop up come up. And it was a super short survey. It was like, what's your name? How do things go today? You know, five to one. Any technical problem occur? Um, anything we should know about. We also, we used a um, more expensive platform, not as expensive as what we were paying for it with those giant teleconference calls that run all the time. Um, but it allowed us to force record all sessions, so someone didn't have to go in and remember turn on recording. Everything was recorded. For us, that was beneficial for two big reasons. One, um, student learned something, they could go back and watch it again and again. Like, how did I, like, Get those pictures into like a music DVD thing that we burnt, they can watch that part of the lesson forever. Um, and the other thing was, if there was any dispute, like the volunteer did something awful on my computer or whatever, we could actually go back and sort of monitor that. So that sort of recording piece had great value for the participants, kind of to, you know, if something's tricky, they can watch it a few times, and for us, for just a sort of quality of service sort of piece. Similar thing with the uh, volunteers, trying to do a traditional sort of intake. A lot of them we did have the opportunity to meet face to face. Some I've never met face to face at all. Just had to stalk them on Facebook and LinkedIn to figure out who they were. Um, so we would do uh, an orientation session, kind of go over like here, you know, there's some policy stuff. Here are some resources that we have. Here's some like best practice that we have in teaching it. Um, we do a separate tech setup of each individual one. The orientation we usually kind of onboard a group of volunteers once a month. The tech setup, we kind of just did one to one to make sure that things were working. That was usually easier because they signed up to volunteer to teach computer skills. Usually they have this sort of technical foundation stuff figured out. Same thing, kind of loop them through on tutoring and then those sort of access surveys over time. And a lot of the volunteers that we've had kind of come into this, especially in this sort of like remote volunteer model, you know, they might be like, all right, I'm going to take the summer off, but I'll, you know, we're back in fall sort of thing. And we've had volunteers that have done this with us for years and years. So we've kind of got a longer standard volunteer base where there's a couple of people that come in our classroom and fairly regular basis, but those usually kind of cycle through. So we've kind of had a longer volunteer engagement model like kind of use webinars as a tutoring platform. So yeah, this is a little dated, but um, just give a bit of an idea of sort of the, so the Moodle was sort of the binder piece when it kind of got started up earlier on. Uh, certainly this has changed since then, but um, yeah, we have a number of webinar rooms with the platform I use. I could create infinite rooms. So I can make each client have a personal room, not to work with someone coming else to someone's classroom or things getting shared, which is valuable for us. And uh, yeah, a number of live sessions and the ability to kind of serve a number of attendees from this sort of platform. Like, there's no way at our offices we get 8,000 people through the door. <laughs> it's just like it wouldn't happen, right? And not in room. So that's sort of what I wanted to share. Though I made a couple of notes just when I was talking to speaking about things that. Um, 
I just have thoughts that I want to kind of add in. I talk about platform stuff, and Zoom seems to be very popular. Who's used Zoom for a webinar platform? Give us like the, the, the two minutes. Like, is it expensive, like from the mid sort of end? Um, I can't speak to the pricing since I don't pay for it. Um, it is in the TechSoup America catalog, but not yet in Canada. I hope to change that. Zoom is like every other webinar platform. It just tends to have been slightly more reliable. And by reliability, I mean I get less complaints by people trying to connect into the conversation. It's not so. It's not like is this connection stronger, but people complain to me less that I couldn't get into the conversation. And I don't know why that is, but that's the reality I experienced. So that's why I like it. I can speak a little bit to that. We had a fancy presentation. Uh, I really got quiet that I need a microphone. Hard to believe I know. Uh, you haven't been drinking yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well. Um, I was going to say, we had a really fancy presentation from the folks at Zoom, and they, <coughs> one of the things they talked about was the technology. <coughs> Zoom is actually really good for the rural communities because they have this fancy technology that adapts to whatever that person's connection is, and it will automatically decrease the, and I guess it's the DPI on the video to make sure that, the, that no um, no audio picking, no audio is missing. So that's kind of what we looked at, and we were like, oh, maybe this would be really beneficial. But because we use a different platform, we haven't made that move, and we don't know if we will because um, we really do like the platform we're using. But other than that, if somebody's got a smaller audience than we have, it might be a good option, and especially for all yeah, I'm not sure those are separate things, just have any name or not, but it's zoom.us is the every meeting request where someone doesn't want to look on a phone with me, but do the sort of online sort of piece lately um, that I've been kind of pulled into that we're starting to look at personally. Um, yeah, that's kind of it for what I want you to do. Another thing is, like, I kind of restart the program piece, but uh, we did start to use it on, like, some special events, like International Day of People with Disabilities. We had this, you know, our executive director talks to the work on brain computer research, so we could use it. It's on that sort of email brand awareness generating piece. And then started doing more volunteer sort of focus sessions, too, and more young interns that were coming in to work with us. Like, let me train them on how to use some basic technology. So, yeah, you, you may start with one piece and then go like, well, there's a special thing and kind of have sort of special pieces and plug in with that. Otherwise, I think that is it.